and welcome back to True Crime with me, Emma Kenny. Unusually wearing pink. Let's put that out there first of all. If you've stumbled across this channel and you've not been here before, well, I release crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday like a military event. It's as simple as that. So if you like crime consistency, this is definitely the channel for you. Although usually I tend to be wearing things like this. Bang to rights, which is one of my merch t-shirts. I've got hoodies. I've got mugs i've got loads of different things also i've got no comment coming and loads of different fun merch stuff including is it just me which is one of my sayings you've been asking for it it is happening but today i'm wearing pink and it says dog lady because most of you know i am and if you see me moving around in this video today it's because i have my little doggy with me this is one of my new babies she's called dolly moo dolly moo I lost her sister a year ago. Unfortunately, her sister died, and fortunately, I managed to get the lady who isn't a breeder, but she just occasionally has a litter, and she had a litter, and she had one that was nearly exactly the same as the one that I lost, so she may be making appearances in this crime video. Just putting it out there if you're wondering why I'm moving around weirdly or I seem to be going up and down, it's probably because I'm dealing with a little puppy. Like I said, thanks for all your support. I always say that. Your comments, your likes, your subscriptions. If you haven't subscribed yet, take a moment to. Take a second and you'll get my content every single week, twice a week, religiously. And if you do get through this and you do like what you see and you haven't subscribed by the end, we'll make a mental note to do so. Also, like I said, to anybody who's supporting me on Patreon, thank you so much. Can never get my head around it. Love the fact that you do that because you like me making content and hopefully it means that I'm going to be able to carry on making more and more content that you like. Thanks for all your support, guys. I hope you're all well. Let's get on with today's case. And it was one of those that I heard about and it did take quite a lot of time to research because there were quite a lot of twists and turns in this. But nonetheless, it is one of those cases where you kind of sit back and say to yourself, sometimes people who try their best to make a difference to the world and try to help people, there is this saying, my brother uses it constantly. He says, never a good deed goes unpunished. He says that to me a lot because I'm one of those people that kind of wants to do as much good as possible, but sometimes you get kicked in the teeth, right? And he will constantly say to me, well, you know, Em, never a good deed goes unpunished because constantly you'll do something nice and then it'll just backfire. And this story feels like it literally embodies that entire statement. So hold it tight because this is going to be one of those where at the end you're like, oh my God. So I'm going to take you through the characters in this. We have Anne Schreiber, who was a Danish-born physiotherapist, and David Schreiber. He was a translator with a military background. This couple get married in 1982, and they had three children. That's Rose and Louise and Thomas. Now, Thomas Schreiber was actually born very, very prematurely, and it was quoted that he was so tiny, he was able to fit into his father's palm. And I can completely empathize with this because my first child was born Prem and he was utterly tiny and he used to fit just a bit bigger than my palm with respect. He was only six weeks early, but nonetheless, he was really tiny. And obviously that meant that he was in Naiku and it was a challenging time. And I think for this family, whenever you're in a situation when a baby's born Prem, it's not that you love them any differently to your other children, but you're just instantly turned on to this protective mechanism within you. So as a family, that was obviously going to mean that Thomas Schreiber was given some very special attention early on. The family themselves seemed relatively affluent. They lived in a grade two listed farmhouse in a lovely Dorset village of Stalbridge Western. So it's a really nice place to grow up. And what would I say about this family from the research that I've done? Well, as far as people who knew them are concerned, they literally, these are the quotes that people put into this family when they were looking into the way that they were being, bringing up their kids. The parents poured love and affection onto Schreiber and his two older sisters, literally poured love 
onto them. So they had a very loving experience as a family. I mean, we could argue that the words spoiled them potentially come into that. And I can acknowledge that. I've got two boys. They're teenagers. I spoil them. I don't necessarily think it's a good thing either. I'm just saying that a lot of us who maybe grew up without having lots around us because our parents didn't have the capacity to give it us, when you've got your own kids, you just kind of want them to have everything that you maybe didn't have. And then you forget that actually the only thing that really matters to children is really lots of love and good boundaries. But these kids were like lots of kids. They were given a great deal. They were spoiled rotten. Now, what would I say about Thomas Schreiber as a child? One of the things that was very notable, that does stand out and is very different from the temperaments of his sisters, is he was considered to have a very ferocious temper. That temper was the type that would blow up out of control in circumstances where it didn't seem relevant. So, of course, we all know that children express themselves in lots of different ways. I was a screamer. Literally, I can own that. My mum said that regularly our neighbours would say, is Emma having a bad day? Because I would just like shout at the top of my voice, which is really weird because I'm really peaceful and don't do that at all. And in my home, I've got a no shouting rule. But as a kid, I didn't get the memo. Hadn't got the memo, memo hadn't come. And I felt that I wanted to share my arguments with the whole of the neighbourhood. It's as simple as that. So I appreciate that kids can act out sometimes but when it's out of context so when it's not to do with a moment of conflict or a frustration or not necessarily getting what you want that draws our attention to some problematic behavior we don't expect children to be highly irrational with their temper and when we think about the words ferocious temper that is giving us a level of insight isn't it to the potential level of child's control over themselves and to some degree most kids will grow out of it but not all children do some kids do go on to have real big problems with their temperament as adolescents and adults so he's got this marker at this moment in time also worth bringing in that david thomas schreiber's father did have three children from a previous marriage to a woman called patricia schreiber so that was piers kate and adam now the reason that that relationship ended between David and Patricia, according to friends at least, was that it ended in divorce when he fell basically for his Danish nanny, Anne. Now Anne was 15 years his junior. So we are introduced at this point to the relationship between David and Anne having a potential power imbalance, aren't we? She's 15 years his junior, also she's employed as his nanny, a little bit of a stereotype. A little bit of a stereotype, older guy runs off with nanny, who's meant to be there to look after the kids for the wife. But never mind, you can kind of see that there is an imbalance of power there. Of course there is. And probably Anne, who's an 18 year old girl, would look up to him in a way that would have some kind of hero worship. And even though on one level you can say, well, that's kind of good in a relationship. We want people to have potentially valuable and positive traits towards their partner. To some degree, it can also be problematic because we're not necessarily thinking about the traits that are really important to us in the long term. We're dealing with our lustful feelings and our childish feelings towards those individuals. At 18, you are not making the same decisions, are you, that you will when you are 30. Now, aside from the fact that there had been this initial dysfunction that had led to Anne and David getting together, this family that they then created, as I've said, were doted on. Schreiber himself was incredibly close to his father, was said to dote on him entirely, and the description that was used by him to explore and to denote the relationship that they had was, it was fantastic. And I think we can all appreciate dads are really really important if we get lucky if we look out and have a really great father like i did then you do feel so blessed that you do want to give words like fantastic over to that relationship because they're one-offs aren't they they're these incredibly close human connections that it's hard to describe you just know that between the two of you there is this uniqueness of connection and of course millions of us have it 
but it feels completely unique to us because that individual belongs to the individual that we are and so on and so forth. So this fantastic relationship was there. But David was not a perfect dad. I'm not saying that he wasn't wonderful in lots of different ways. I'm saying that he had issues because he had an addiction with alcohol, basically. He was considered a semi-functional alcoholic. That is always going to prove a huge problem in any personal relationship. You just have to ask yourself about when you've had a drink. Whether we're the funnest drunk or the saddest drunk, if you have a drink, you are not as present for your family as you are when you don't have a drink. And if you're doing that every single day, certainly that is gonna cause some issues in the relationship. So even though David and Schreiber had this relationship that was meant to be fantastic, undoubtedly there would be problems within it because of David's issues with alcohol. He was also, as a father, known to be a little bit unpredictable at times. So he would go outside and he would discharge his guns outside the farmhouse where they lived. He was also notably known to threaten to kill himself regularly. So even though we're talking about this very close family whose children are being spoiled and who have a loving connection, we have these dysfunctions that are very clear. It is highly upsetting for any child or family member to see a parent go outside and discharge a shotgun. It just isn't something that we wanna see. It's really powerful when we have caregivers who act as great role models. It's really what teaches us, it's what guides us. If you haven't got that, instead you've got somebody who is chaotic and challenging and at times seems to put themselves at risk and of course at times threatens that they wish to put themselves at risk. That is not ideal to grow up within. No matter how nostalgic we are, we've all got our rose-coloured spectacles when we look back on our lives, but these are very traumatising events without a doubt. Now, the Schreibers came from a lovely area, and within that area, there was a very aristocratic family known as the Suttons. And actually, the Schreibers were really good friends with them. The Suttons were made up of Sir Richard Lexington Sutton, his wife, Lady Fiamma Sutton, and they actually had two children together, David and Caroline. Now, because these aristocrats are known in the area, obviously people have got opinions of them, and they are a big part of the community. So they're well known. And Sir Richard was described in a really, really positive way. In fact, he was described as warm and generous and very compassionate by his family, but also by the community who knew him. So this man was somebody who was very much the centre of his family's world, but because of the fact he was an aristocrat and he had the most incredible place that he lived, which I'll talk about in a second, he was obviously somebody who was well known. He was actually one of Britain's richest men. Really, really wealthy. The kind of wealth I imagine happens if you win the Euro Millions six days on the run. Which is something, guys, that I often imagine. Is it just me? Is it just me who imagines that? Sometimes I have to then go through the whole experience of deciding how much I'd actually be able to keep for the universe to keep being nice to me. Because I'd see it as a test. If I won 168 million, which is the figure that in my head I do, I'm like, surely I'd only be able to keep two. And then I'm like, is two too much? It gets confusing. It's probably good that I haven't and probably never will win the lottery. Although if I do win the lottery, I will be able to answer that question. Anyway, bear in mind, this guy is loaded, essentially. Now, his ancestry can actually be traced back to the time of William the Conqueror. So this is how embedded in British history this family are. And he was actually listed at number 435 in the Sunday Times Rich List last year. So incredibly wealthy. In fact, what the estimate is regarding his wealth is that the family fortune was worth about 301 million pounds, which is relatively well off, isn't it? You're not struggling and doing what I do, going to the bargain basement at Lidl to see whether you can get day old bread for 22p. Anyway, very wealthy family and incredibly wealthy property owner and landowner, in fact. So he had more than 16,000 acres in the UK and in the US. 
also his property portfolio because I've looked it up, included the Athenaeum Hotel and Spa in London's Piccadilly. It's not a travel lodge, nothing against travel lodges. Do spend quite a lot of time in travel lodges. Just saying, I'd rather go to the Athenaeum Hotel and Spa in London's Piccadilly. Also, the five-star Sheraton Grand on London's Park Lane, which I have walked past. Yes, I've walked past it. I've never been in, but nonetheless, to say it's beautiful is an understatement. It's luxurious. So, 2002. So David and Anne, who've obviously been in this relationship for a period of time after getting together when she was a nanny, it starts to experience some strain. And part of this is down to the fact that David is really struggling. His alcoholism is worsening. He's becoming more and more dependent on alcohol. And through that, he starts to develop this really challenging chronic memory disorder. Now, this is something that we can see when people are highly dependent on alcohol, even though a lot of us drink, and some of us will actually drink huge quantities and seemingly not suffer, there are individual cases where you cannot quite believe that somebody has sustained their lives for the entirety of their lives without having terrible issues with their physical health in spite of their drinking. But for the average human, the more and more that you drink, the more reliant and dependent that you become on alcohol, Obviously, you can have things like cirrhosis of the liver, and actually, all of our vital organs are impacted by alcohol, but the brain itself can become horribly damaged. So you can look up brain scans of individuals with high level alcoholism, and you can see the damage that occurs. And one of the things that can happen is the memory is impacted on. And for people who live with people, who might have completely unrelated issues to do with memory, let's say Alzheimer's, early onset dementia, and so on and so forth. It's really challenging because you feel like you're losing the person that you knew. You feel that person that you loved and spent your life with and who you shared your world with just isn't present in the same way. And for the most part, that doesn't stop you caring for them, but it definitely shifts the relationship. Add to that the fact that you feel that somebody is going out of their way to cause that kind of chaos within your world because they are choosing an action such as drinking. You can imagine that that is going to have massive frustrations in a relationship. Also, through this situation, he gets declared bankrupt. So obviously there is debt and there is a chaos within that experience that is causing big problems in the family life. Because of this, the family risk losing their home. Now that is horrible for children and horrible for adults per se. I think in a capitalist environment, and let's be honest, in the Western world, that's what we're talking about. We're living in a capitalist system whereby our homes denote success or failure at times. And when we feel that they're at threats, it takes away a major foundation in our world. I remember when I was a single mum, getting to a point where I couldn't afford to pay the mortgage because life was very different back then. And even thinking about that knowledge that this day could come where I wouldn't be able to be in my house anymore because I couldn't afford to make payments, it was such a stressor. And it didn't end up that way, but I look back and it always reminds me to work as hard as possible because of the fact that I've been in that situation. So I can completely understand that in any relationship, when you get to a circumstance where you fear that particularly if one party is causing the issue, you're gonna lose the very foundation of what makes you feel safe, that is gonna be a massive disruptor in their relationship. And also to note, David also falls into a depression. So there is a lot going on in this family. And when we think about our initial observations of them being the kind of parents who soak their children in love, to being in a scenario where they might not be able to keep them in their own home, there is a really, really severe drop, isn't there, in their living experience. Now in 2003, unbelievably and really beautifully, the family is basically thrown a lifeline. They get invited to live at Moor Hill. So Moor Hill is that two million pound estate of the family friend, Sir Richard Hutton. So Sir Richard Hutton basically steps in and says, you guys are struggling. I've got this place in the hamlet of Higher Langham near Gillingham, which is in Dorset. Come and live here. I'm gonna help you with your financial issues. I mean, that is a rare, rare human. The fact that you're looking at this individual 
and you're seeing their problems that are affecting their family and you recognize that you're in a scenario where you can change their life. Now, at this point, Sir Richard, who's making this offer, his marriage, which he'd been in for over 40 years to Fiamma, has actually broken down. And she's returned to her native Italy and she's actually in a new relationship. So I guess arguably we could say that on a psychological level, he was probably feeling a little bit lonely, maybe a little bit isolated. And the fact that his wife is no longer present in his life means that he's also got more time. So he extends this invitation to the family. Now, Anne, the mother, she ultimately accepts it because first of all, she's thinking about her children and the financial security that she can provide for her family. This is an opportunity for her to live rent free on this beautiful property in Moorhill. So this is an option that she doesn't want to refuse. David doesn't take it though. So David actually remains at their home and at the same time, he doesn't just accept that his family is moving elsewhere. He refuses to have any treatment for his alcoholism. So you can imagine the fracture now that is occurring within that family. Anne has got this lifeline also, it would mean that David could go with them. They wouldn't have the financial pressures and strains. And the consequence may be that he would be able to at least acknowledge his addiction and maybe have the courage to start working on it. But for whatever reason, David doesn't want to do that. And again, we have to have some sympathy and empathy with him. Maybe he's already dealing with this chaos of his addiction. He's in an awful depression, which we all know is horrific to deal with. And the idea of moving onto somebody else's property to live rent free may feel highly demasculating. It may be the final insult that he feels his family is giving him because he's no longer considered the man about the house or an individual who can provide his family with what they require. Now, because the family move, basically a lot of their possessions are also transferred from the family farmhouse to Sir Richard's estate, which is about nine miles away. Now, Schreiber was 17 when this was happening. I think we can all remember what it was like to be 17 years of age. I mean, number one, we think we know absolutely everything when we know absolutely nothing on the whole. And secondly, the world hits us hard. It really does. I've often said this in my crime videos. The reality is that when you are a teenager, you don't have, at least on the whole, in the Western world, there are places where at 17, you're working every hour that God sends and you're providing for your wider family, we accept that. But in the Western world, very often 17 year olds have got more time than they will have at 27 because they have the protection of their family around them. So it gives people the time to indulge in the way that they feel. And on one level, that can be great for self-development. On another, it can be very debilitating because particularly if you're struggling, there's this time for reflection, resentment. There are these feelings that are difficult to dislodge and difficult to take anywhere because you're 17, but they feel very, very real. And Thomas Schreiber actually described his life at the time as being a living hell. The process of moving from, remember, the relationship that he considered fantastic with his father to living with a relative stranger, rent free albeit, but seeing the division within his family occur, that was gonna be psychologically traumatizing. And indeed it was. So again, I'm not gonna say that this young lad who, as we know, had a tremendous issue with containing himself emotionally and was seen to have a terrible temper. At the same time, we have to have a lot of empathy with him at this moment in time. He's 17, his family feels like it's falling apart. He's losing a very integral and important relationship with his father, probably feeling deeply guilty at the fact that he's going with his mother and also experiencing the chaos of that change. So this is where he feels his psychological experience is at in that moment. Now, soon after this actual move had occurred, Anne and Sir Richard actually begin a physical relationship. And they do actually go on to marry, but Again, I think we can all envisage the fact that for Schreiber, this is his worst nightmare. 
He's left his father's sanctuary, albeit imperfect. His mother's moved on and now she's actually with the man who's offered them sanctuary. And I imagine that he would have considered this duplicitous, that there was a separate motive for why Sir Richard had wanted his mother Anne to move to the property, that he maybe wanted to pursue her and he succeeded to do that. And because they go on to marry, that does to some degree play out. Also worth noting though, in spite of the fact that Anne and Sir Richard get married, Schreiber's sister became very much involved in that new paradigm, that new family dynamic. And she absolutely loved Sir Richard as a father. But Schreiber himself, no. He never had a close relationship with him. In fact, on reflection, and I use this word not lightly, genuinely, because I'm not an individual who believes that hate is something that very many of us ever truly understand. We use the term frivolously, but to really hate somebody is a very dark feeling. There has to be something incredibly entangled within our psyche to form that kind of feeling. But basically, I would say Schreiber hated him from the start. Sir Richard never had a chance with him. Also, ironically, we're talking about this unbelievably wealthy man. We're talking about an individual, as I've said, going on worth 400 million, massive landowner, can basically provide the family with whatever they wanted. But it feels like Schreiber very much resented this. He resented the reliance that he would actually come to have on Sir Richard. In fact, he felt that Basically, Sir Richard was trying to buy his family's affections. And on one level, we can have some sympathy and empathy. Okay, he finds his mum in a relationship with this very wealthy landowner. But you don't get it both ways. You don't get to resent somebody, but to take the money off them to have a nice life. And Schreiber was doing that. He was more than happy to take the money from Sir Richard but he resented the fact that he was doing so. So again, we almost see that cognitive dissonance, don't we? The fact that on one level, he hates the fact that he's getting this money. And on another level, he wants the money. It's this real conflict and they can cause really problematic feelings because you totally feel in turmoil. I don't want to have a relationship with that person, I need that person, and so on and so forth. But this idea that Sir Richard's trying to buy the family and that Schreiber's mother has been bought, so to speak. Now, by the time that Schreiber gets to his late teens, he actually goes to school and college in Denmark, and he studies music technology also in London. He then starts DJing, and he basically collects a lot of vinyl records, and it does feel like he's never quite able to hold down jobs. He's constantly moving from place to place, tends to work in the capital, but nonetheless, he's constantly moving around his jobs. Doesn't mean that he's not talented, and certainly the fact that he's collecting vinyl and he's training in music says that he's got some aspirations, but it feels when you look at this particular individual, and I'll tell you a little bit more about his history regarding work later on, but there is just something lacking in his capacity to stick at things. And sometimes when children and young people have been given a lot, particularly if money isn't that much of an option or an issue, it's hard to ever really feel that you're going to stick at things because things don't have the same meaning. I always say that the best place to be in life when you're a child is hungry for something. If you're hungry for something, you want to fill that gap, you know? For some of us, we're literally hungry for food, so we realise that as an adult, we're always going to get jobs that mean that we can feed ourselves. For some, we're hungry to have success, so we feel that we're going to work harder than our peers to achieve it, and so on and so forth. But if you've always had that gap filled because because nothing's ever been too far out of reach, it can have a real problem psychologically. And you'd be amazed how many very, very wealthy people go into therapy because they literally can't find purpose and meaning because everything was just given to them. Sometimes it's really good to have things held out of reach so you have to really chase it. And it's not even about the achieving it's about knowing that you're constantly and perpetually moving forward. And sometimes the place that you thought you were going to end up with that success is a completely different place altogether. But it's the same thing that fed you. It's that gap. It's that hunger. And it feels like he doesn't quite have that. And that's one of the big reasons why he doesn't ever find himself settling. So whilst Schreiber is off doing these little bits and bobs of jobs, 
Sir Richard, meanwhile, offers David, Schreiber's own father, with all the issues that he's got, an opportunity to actually move into Moor Hill. He offers his, him one of the bungalows which are on the grounds. And the reason that he said he could come to live in that bungalow on the grounds, bear in mind at this point, Sir Richard and Anna together and David is essentially the ex. He says, we will look after you, but we want you to go into rehab. So it's basically an intervention. You come here, we will put you up rent free, we will look after you, we will pay for you to go into rehab, but that's what you have to do. David refuses. And actually David died on the 7th of April, 2013. Now on one level, we can all say, well, why didn't David take that option? Realistically, he had children, a lot of children with respect, and he could have made a huge difference by accepting the help, by going into rehab, by getting well. But on the other hand, imagine being the ex. Imagine being the person who feels that your wife has left you, potentially left you at a time when you're really struggling, even though we can completely understand her reasons for doing that and have empathy and sympathy for that, but put it into David's perspective. And then the man that she's with, this wealthy landowner, this individual who can just wave a magic wand and make everything apparently all right to some degree, offers you the opportunity to be healed by him. That's gonna be challenging, isn't it? Because you would feel that you were literally shaking the hand of the person who punched you. And so I do have a complete empathy with why David says, no, I wish he hadn't. I think all of us can agree that we wish that David had just accepted that and moved on with his life and been the father that he was clearly capable of being, but he couldn't make that leap. So he dies. And that again is something that's gonna have a really catastrophic effect on the family per se, because there are so many feelings going on in this situation and Schreiber himself was massively affected by his father's death. In fact, suffice to say, and this isn't me saying this, this is the people who knew him, they all say he was completely unable to come to terms with it. And it just started to build further this resentment he resented the fact that his mother and Sir Richard didn't do more to help his father. That, to me, is a little bit extreme because I think it's very unusual to have the ex-partner offered a rehab facility and a place to live free on the current partner of the wife's land and so on and so forth. I think that that's a very unusual and generous thing to do. But nonetheless, for Schreiber, it was not enough. And I guess it's because as far as he was concerned, you can't fix the initial breach, which is the fact that Anne left David and moved in with Sir Richard. So that was never gonna get healed, so to speak, no matter what Richard did. Now in 2016, Schreiber does make a move. He goes to Australia with his girlfriend. So that's positive. Obviously, what we can say there is he's trying to stride out on his own. He's thinking about new opportunities, new horizons, and hopefully we can all agree that seeing the world is something that's positive psychologically for people because it kind of makes you think a little bit differently. However, 2019, he and his girlfriend have broken up and so he moves back to the UK. And it's at this point the family really noticed that there just seems to have been a decline in his mental health, there is something significant that they notice. He doesn't seem himself, he's more depressed. And Sir Richard, as we've seen before, well, he steps in and he says, there is a place that you can stay with us. You can come and live at Moor Hill. Let's get you back on your feet. And Schreiber at this point is 33. So we're not talking about a 20 year old young man, we're not talking about an 18 year old, we're talking about a properly grown up adult. 33 is a fully fledged adult. And he's again being given this opportunity to just come home and get himself together. And he's offered this really spacious annex at Moor Hill. And the whole deal is, it's about him getting back on his feet. So it's meant to be for like a few weeks, but it literally became permanent. Now, for some of you out there, you'll be like, that's my dream. It's my dream too. My dream is my kids are like, do you know what, mum? I've decided I'm just going to like stay with you forever. And I'll be like, oh, that's the blimmin' processing that I've been programming you with for the last 18 years has worked. Damn, I'm good. But for other parents, 
the idea would be the worst nightmare and they're like, you're 18, here's your bag, leave. Either way, we're all doing the best that we can, right? But for this particular situation, it's not ideal. Schreiber is not a great tenant, shall we say. But nonetheless, even though he's meant to be there a few weeks, it just turns into this permanent residency. And you would think that potentially, based on the fact that he's not having to pay rent, based on the fact that he's being looked after, based on the fact that he's living in luxurious annex in the most unbelievable grounds of an incredible, incredible place, that he may feel, I don't know, privileged, throw it out there, a little bit grateful. No, not at all. Not grateful at all. Really, really resentful. Again, just going to throw in psychology because I'll help it. But psychologically, sometimes when we have these really negative feelings towards somebody and they just kill us with kindness, as opposed to it neutralizing that feeling, it can just provoke it. It almost feels like the person is purposefully and willfully being nice to us just to make us feel angry. Of course, we're completely skewed and wrong, but that is regularly the way that people will describe that feeling. It's like taking a hot iron and burning them with it, even though the truth is that the person is genuinely being kind. And part of that is to do the way that we perceive the world. If within us we have some darkness, some resentment, some bitterness, like let's say as a human being we have these really negative feelings and thoughts to others and we are nasty about people and we are ungracious and we are quite bitter, our belief system is that other people feel similar to us. So when people are being really nice because they are really nice, we can't take it that way. We will see it as manipulation. We will see it as them trying to manipulate us in a way to get what they want, i.e. they're trying to exploit us. And people will often feel that they're too clever for that and they'll see it as something that it's clearly not, but then try to convince themselves that the reason that person is apparently being so nice is to get something from them. They're wrong. It's a completely skewed perception. But if you have those hostile feelings and people are genuinely just really nice, you don't buy it because you have a problem with your own psyche. And I think that's what's going on here. There is something going on that is creating that resentment to grow. Now, I don't wanna be completely down on Schreiber. We have talked about the fact that he's obviously got an interest in music, etc. but he was also a really promising painter. He was a great artist. And one of the things that he talked about is that one of his psychological methods of coping was that he would paint in this makeshift studio that he made up in the snooker room. He considered it his only solace. That's what he said about the experience. It was his passion. It really helped to soothe his mind. But he believed, again, probably incorrectly, that his family didn't take his artistic aspirations seriously. Can you see how somebody can buy into that mindset? It wouldn't matter if people were around you saying how fabulous you were, how fantastic you were doing. If you are bought into this belief that you are a victim, that you are somebody who never gets what they deserve, that people are always out to get you, that nothing you do is good enough, then it won't be. It won't matter about anybody else's judgments. You will just live in that mire of belief, a myth that you've created. And certainly Schreiber seems to fit that paradigm. Also, a little bit like his father, and again, when we think about alcoholism, when we think about dependency, we have to explore the fact that when you look at family history, you are more likely to be a drinker who has problems if you have parents or grandparents who have drinking problems. Possibly DNA, possibly experiential growing up. The point is, David, his father, had alcohol problems and Schreiber starts to because he uses it to self-medicate and he becomes a very regular, very heavy drinker. Bear in mind, we already know he has an incredibly short temper and he has very deep-rooted resentment. If you put those two together, that is a very dangerous cocktail. We all know people who shouldn't drink, right? We all know that there is a thread that runs within them that is angry and hostile. And if they are sober, they can maintain and manage it to some degree. But if they drink heavily and are under the influence, wow, the damage that can occur. 
So when we know ourselves, part of knowing ourselves is knowing what works and what fails to work with who we are. And Schreiber has not figured that out. And he uses alcohol in spite of the fact that this doesn't impact on him psychologically, positively at all. Now, March 2019, Schreiber does actually attend a four day residential course, which is all about helping to deal with trauma and addiction. That's really positive. At the end of the day, if you recognize that you are struggling and you also can acknowledge that there is some trauma within you, and I think we can all agree that Schreiber's had some trauma in his life. He's watched his dad shooting guns outside, being very drunk, threatening his own life. He's seen his parents divorce. He's had to move to a new place. He's watched his mum in new relationships and so on and so forth. There is trauma there without a doubt. But the fact that he goes on this four day course demonstrates that he's at least trying at this point to consider making a difference. And the reason that he goes is basically he wants to address his anger issues. They do an assessment on him, of course. And at this point they establish that he is indeed an alcoholic, but Schreiber is not happy with this diagnosis. He doesn't feel that he fits that category. And because of this, he's unwilling to recognize that he needs help. It is that phrase, you cannot change what you don't acknowledge, right? We all agree with that. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's Dr. Phil who says that. I'm sure that's one of his major statements. You cannot change what you won't acknowledge. But nonetheless, it is actually true. You have to first be aware of what it is that is wrong before you can ever do anything effective to make a change to it. You have to transmute the knowledge into understanding and then action. And Schreiber is not even willing to put it at the knowledge stage. So he's not willing to accept help. And again, I hate to use the word victim mentality because as any of you who watch me or watch me in mental health areas, I do not blame victims in any way, shape or form. In any situation, when you're a dependent, you have a disease. However, if you choose to remain where you are, then you are choosing, you are volunteering for that path. You do not have to volunteer for that path. There is a survivor mentality that you can take on. And Schreiber has every single option available to him because financially they can afford it. For us mere mortals, I couldn't afford to go to rehab. I'm sure most of you watching couldn't afford to go to rehab. I might be able to go to AA because that's available and free. But for most of us, the luxury that you would be given to just be able to be unhappy or struggle with your depression or have a dependency issue and just be able to go somewhere and have somebody help you. I mean, that is so far out of reach for most of us, certainly for me. So he is choosing that path. He has all these opportunities and he's turning them down. Also, even though he went to this particular four day experience, it doesn't feel like the anger gets challenged in any way, shape or form. If anything, it's like the anger and resentment grows. And I wonder whether part of that is to do with the fact that they told him, you have a problem, you are an alcoholic. And instead of him going, all right, that's my stuff, that's something I need to deal with, it was easy to say, well, I am just reacting to all this stuff that's happened to me. If they hadn't done A, B and C, then I wouldn't feel this way. Therefore, it's their fault. I'm not gonna have to deal with this. It's they who need to change. It's they who need to accept that they're the people who have caused these issues. And by displacing that responsibility, firstly, he doesn't need to deal with it. And secondly, he has an outlet for all these unmanageable feelings that he's creating himself. Because I think one of the things that alcoholism and dependency always does for the individual experiencing it, it causes this horrific shame. I think most of us have been in situations in our lives where we've not been acting as we wish we had act. And you wake up in the morning with that dread and that shame and that feeling of knowing you could do better. I guess it's the voice of conscience, the feeling of conscience. But for a lot of us, it's so overwhelming that it's easier to then just carry on the behavior to sedate it because it is actually really, really painful. Also, as I said earlier, Schreiber, a little bit like his father, does have mental health issues. And one of the big changes that is noted is he starts becoming really paranoid. And paranoia is horrible for anybody to experience, without a doubt. My father suffered horrifically from paranoia before his death. And it is one of the most disconcerting and painful things to see in somebody that you love. Because it's all very well, you know that you don't want to steal all their money or sell their house from under their feet. But if they genuinely believe that that's what you want to do, they're living that feeling. 
So he becomes really paranoid and that would be very challenging for everybody around him. One of the things that he becomes fixated on is he feels that Sir Richard just isn't treating him in a financial equivalent to how he's treating his sisters. So he believes that Sir Richard is favoring them. And of course, if he's got these deep insecurities and he's struggling anyway because he's got these mental health issues and these dependency issues, and then he fixates on the fact that, well, if money equates the level of feeling you have for people and you're treating my sisters with more money, therefore you are now colluding with my feeling that you don't care for me in the way that you should as a stepfather, which then allows me to feel completely at peace with this idea that I'm allowed to resent and be bitter towards you. It feeds that, doesn't it? It feeds that growing picture. It's an incorrect picture, and it's a picture that can lead to disaster, but you can see where this paranoia would be being fed. Let me tell you as well, Schreiber is completely wrong, and it will blow your mind when I tell you how wrong he is because he is treating each of the children exactly the same. He has given each of them 100,000 pounds as a deposit to buy a house. And he's also given a monthly 1,000 pound allowance just for existing. I mean, that's huge. A 100 grand deposit to just go and buy yourself a house. And then a thousand pounds a month, which basically for most of us would pay our mortgage. And that's what he's given each of them. Also bear in mind the fact that Schreiber is living rent free with his mother and Sir Richard. So he's hardly in a bad situation, but he doesn't believe that's the case. And clearly we're being introduced as well to Schreiber having this massive, enormous sense of entitlement to Sir Richard's money. And just remember only earlier on, he's going on about how bitter he is about the fact that this guy can just buy whatever he wants, you know but when he's actually giving him loads of cash, that's still a problem. So I think we can see, can't we? Sir Richard cannot win on any level. It's as simple as that. No matter what he does, he's still gonna be a problem. And also remember, he's getting this money in spite of the fact that right now, he's a jobless painter. Albeit that he's a good artist, he's not making any money. He's being fully supported by the family. I am jealous, I'm not going to lie. I'm not jealous of the internal dialogue and the paranoia and the depression and all those things. I'm jealous of the fact that somebody handed him 100,000 pounds and gives him a grand a month just for existing. I want somebody to do that. If anybody wants to do that, I will be very grateful. I'll be very grateful. I won't be the kind of person that Schreiber is. I'll write your letters and send you Christmas cards and probably send you hampers with the money that you're sending me. Obviously, so it'll kind of be you spending it on me to spend on you. You know where I'm going with that. Another gripe that Schreiber had about his relationship with Sir Richard as well was that Sir Richard wouldn't let him drive his cars. Now he did drive his Range Rover. Apparently Sir Richard was not very happy about it. Probably Schreiber, because you're a pretty bad drunk. Just throwing it out there. Do you want something in your Range Rover, driving it when they're a bit drunk? No, neither would I. I haven't even got one because they're very expensive. Anyway. The gripe that he has is that Sir Richard's basically got an Aston Martin. And Schreiber is like, if you loved me, you'd let me drive your Aston Martin. And Sir Richard sensibly is like, I don't care if I love you more than anybody else in the whole world. My Aston Martin is going nowhere near you. You drink heavily and you are unpredictable. So basically, Sir Richard keeps these Aston Martin keys in his pocket. And again, Schreiber sees that as a really aggressive stance, like he's denying him something that he wants. Again, going back to that idea of being spoiled and entitled, that is a very spoiled and entitled attitude, isn't it? I don't know about you guys, but at no point did I ever think when I had my dad, ah, oh, just be able to drive your car, just give it me. I mean, I'm not quite sure that a Honda Civic kind of fits the same narrative, but nonetheless, my dad would have been really annoyed if I just walked in and be like, I'm just taking your car out, dad. It's not what normal humans do, is it? And an Aston Martin is an incredibly expensive piece of gear, isn't it? So you're not gonna want somebody who is under the influence using it. Now, Sir Richard's daughter, Caroline Sutton, she actually stated on reflection that one of the things that Sir Richard really struggled with around Schreiber was that he was really rude and disrespectful. 
In fact, he would always go out of his way to be negative. He wouldn't help him in the house. And bear in mind what we're thinking about, this is a household that is huge and where Schreiber is living for free, but he didn't contribute in any way, shape or form. He sponged off him, he lived rent free, despite being given this 100,000 towards his own house. And eventually Sir Richard starts to get annoyed with this situation. He wants Schreiber out of the house, but Schreiber won't go. So it's not one of these situations where you tell somebody, please leave, and they leave, albeit awkward. It's a plane, it's not happening, I'm not going. That in itself is a very disturbing boundary. We're talking about a grown man. We're not talking about an immature teenager. We're talking about a grown adult who has access and means to leave because he's been financially provided for and it's still a no. And that's worrying because if somebody feels that entitled, that even when they're being told to move on from a place that they have no actual financial hold over, where simply they are a guest and they feel completely at ease to refuse, that starts to give us an insight into the superiority of that individual. That's a real arrogance. And again, think about the kind of moods that this man has. He's very entitled, he's very lazy, he's at times out of control tempo-wise, he gets depressed, he's also got problems with alcohol, and most importantly out of all of those things, he feels that boundaries do not apply to him. And he also believes that everything around him should be something he is entitled to. There is an ownership and territorial nature to his beliefs. They're incorrect beliefs, stroke delusions, but they exist. So we know Schreiber is entitled. We know he's very lazy. We know that he has struggled through his life. I will note that some of his family members believe that, well, maybe there was an issue with the premature birth. Maybe he had had some brain damage, you know, at the end of the day when you're born very early, there can be some issues. I mean, you can think about orbital cortex damage or ventromedial prefrontal cortex damage. These are issues that we can certainly see in brain scans. If the connectivity is poor, you may have problems with things like impulse control and empathy. But again, I've got a premature kid and he is compassionate, lovely, vegan and fabulous. So again, it's not enough to just say that that would be the reason. We can also note that he definitely had a problem with sticking and staying power. He never stayed in the same job for long. And in fact, you will be mind blown when I tell you this. He had 35 jobs from the age of 18. That's a lot of jobs. I don't think I've applied for that many jobs in my life, but 35 jobs since being 18. And you can't help believing that he had this feeling that the world owed him a living. Also, people said that on a nature level, he was constantly sarcastic and he had this total superiority complex and respect and Schreiber literally did not coexist at all. And he didn't show respect to his mother, to his sisters or to Sir Richard, his stepdad. There was no respect whatsoever. Now, bear in mind the fact that we're talking about a man where it's Sir Richard is concerned, who had been highly generous. And it feels like the more generous he becomes, the more Schreiber's hatred and resentment grows. And again, I come back to this position that I fully believe, I think it begins, middles and ends, when his mother abandons his father. I don't think there was ever gonna be an opportunity where Schreiber would allow himself to forgive what he believes Sir Richard did which is to breach and break his family unit. Like I said, it's a false belief at the end of the day. The reason that the breakdown between David and Anna occurred were very clearly to do with David's behavior and probably just a general breakdown in a relationship that we all see happen many times. This is what happens in life. But it's almost like Schreiber was just pinning the blame on Sir Richard. And I also need to know that it's around this time that this resentment is building that Sir Richard is starting to get more and more consumed with just getting Schreiber out of the house. And I have total sympathy with him. Who wants to live with somebody who makes you feel like you mean nothing and like you've done nothing when all you've done is tried to make their life better? Now, the family do start getting concerned. They really do. Because at this moment in time, we have Sir Richard, Schreiber and Anne, Schreiber's mother, living at Moorhill. There's like this vicious triangle, so to speak. 
And Sir Richard starts to have conversations with people in the family and describes the way he feels as being like a prisoner in his own home. He feels completely locked down with Schreiber. He can't escape him. Also, COVID lockdown happens. So we're in a scenario now where literally this toxicity is breeding itself because of the fact that they can't escape each other at all. And the lockdown was also said to have a really detrimental impact on Schreiber's mental state. So he starts to feel that the lockdown itself is starting to impair him. And he would later say, I was struggling to control my own thoughts. It was a distraction and it was unwelcome. I didn't want these thoughts in my head and I wanted them to stop. So lockdown was giving him this rumination time, a real opportunity to fully reflect on who he was, where he was, what was happening. And I guess that most of us can relate to that sense of feeling suffocated and a bit like a prisoner. Certainly I felt like that in lockdown. And I think even now, dealing with constant fears of it recurring again, I feel that same sentiment. So I think even when you're in a really well-adjusted place, you can really struggle with the idea of what lockdown exists to you and for you in the world that you experienced it because of your previous experiences of it. And certainly for him, he's struggling. Also, it's worth noting that prior to lockdown, when family arguments had ensued, they were very bad. Historically, they had descended into violence. That is not something we expect to see in families. Any kind of domestic abuse should be out of the window when it comes down to any kind of family domestic situation. If you get into scenarios where you become physical, there is a massive problem. And we're talking about adults, remember? So the fact that Schreiber is lashing out really shows you that he shouldn't have been allowed anywhere near his stepfather and his mom. Schreiber had actually previous occasions punched his sister in the face. He'd punched his other sister when they'd been having an argument. He'd actually put his hands around her throat. Now, on that occasion, Sir Richard had been present and he swung a punch at Schreiber, but he actually missed him. And then Schreiber had actually punched Sir Richard to the ground, left him with a black eye, which clearly demonstrates the fact that Schreiber feels completely entitled to use this kind of force on people that he's meant to love. In the summer of 2019, he pulled his mum's hair and he hit her after she called him a fucking leech. Now, I agree, it's not ideal to go around using language like that towards someone. I appreciate that's a provoker, it's an escalator. But with respect, Schreiber had been living off them for years, is an adult, is doing nothing to help himself and is a violent thug in the home. So I think we can have some sympathy and empathy with his mother's reaction. And the fact that he feels entitled to aggress her in such a way is deeply worrying and indicative of future potential violence. Now, November 2020, a family argument again erupts, and this is basically over whether Schreiber's sister should be allowed to inherit a chandelier for her home. I mean, again, think about that. Who gives a crap? about whether somebody inherits a chandelier for the home. But if somebody is that concerned about this, it's because they are choosing to find as much fault as possible. And so if Schreiber is looking for indicators that say that he's not as important, and believe me, this is a man with an arrogance and superiority complex that wants to believe he is the be-all and end-all in the world. So anything that challenges that kind of psychology is gonna make him want to erupt. So this does just that. And basically, an argument ensues, and Sir Richard actually hits Schreiber on his back with a walking cane, and that walking cane shatters. So, arguably, we could say Sir Richard hits him pretty hard. And in Schreiber's defence at this moment in time, I would say that, in his words, he said that he felt traumatised and humiliated by this. He also felt that this moment was a watershed moment in his relationship with his family. Now, I'm not gonna excuse Sir Richard for using violence in that way, but I do wanna bring into the picture that the problem with Schreiber was he was often violent in these situations, and I imagine that Sir Richard is deeply frustrated. Also, let's be honest, Sir Richard is considerably older than Schreiber, so not a threat as Schreiber was to him. Nonetheless, don't go around hitting somebody with 
your walking stick. It's not a good move. But for Schreiber, it triggers something. He feels like this is him essentially being told that he is excluded and less important in the family. And he starts to close himself off at this point from his wider family. One of the things that he wants more than anything is basically for Sir Richard to apologize and it never happens. Now this seems to consume him and he becomes really fueled with this hatred as this time passes. I guess that, you know, on one level we can say, well, maybe Sir Richard should have apologized to him. He did crack him on the back with a walking stick. But arguably, we can also say, well, Sir Richard has got to a point where he just cannot give this man any more and feels that he's been highly ungrateful and doesn't feel that he owes him an apology because of all the things that he's done. Either way, this breakdown in communication is going to have disastrous effects, disastrous impacts. And like I bring in again, lockdown is making all of this worse. If you're going to get fuel and throw it on the fire, well, that's exactly what lockdown does. And it was described by those living there that it felt like a pressure cooker. Simple as that. There was just this undercurrent, this knowing that something was gonna blow. Not quite when, but just knowing that something was gonna happen. Now the same month that incident happened, Schreiber actually told his girlfriend, Sathia Pglusha, that he was putting possessions in storage and he was gonna move out of Moor Hill. He expressed that he didn't feel welcome and he referred to living at Moor Hill as home sweet hell. So we can see he's struggling, but he also starts to express that he's got this desire that he wants to get revenge on his family. He says he wants to shoot his mother in the forehead. Also says he wants to knock her unconscious, punch her so hard, in fact, that he knocks her unconscious. And that in itself is starting to entertain a very dark nature, isn't it? To feel comfortable expressing that as an adult to your girlfriend, the level of emotional immaturity is very clear, isn't it? Because some of us may feel that. I often say, I set people on fire in my head. I don't tell the people that I'm thinking of setting on fire in my head that I'm going to do it. And I don't say to my husband, I've just set Jenny on fire in my head. I don't think it's a good thing to do. Have your little thing in your head and then put it out, you know, get the fire extinguisher emotionally. But to actually express that, again, what is it saying about his nature? Also, same time, he starts contacting his best friend, James Reed in a series of texts. And um, part of that is normal. He asks for advice on dealing with toxic people that you are dependent on. Now, I think that's perfectly acceptable. Get in touch with a friend. It's actually a healthy coping mechanism. You know, if you're struggling, get in touch with a mate, say, what would you do? And Schreiber actually stated in the text, I have a plan which I'm working on. There are many holes in it, but it's a plan nonetheless. Revenge is at its heart which I'm sure I'll regret, but it's about time. So that's full of malice, isn't it? Starting to give us some disturbing insight, isn't it? This idea that he's planning and plotting. He's not sure what's gonna happen, but he knows it's gonna involve revenge. And obviously the fact that he's thinking about it and expressing it means it's a little bit more solid than a fleeting thought, doesn't it? Now, December 2020, he gets in contact with one, another one of his friends, Josh Adamson, and he actually leaves a really long voicemail, which is expressing all of his grievances that he has. So he says that he's unhappy that Sir Richard hadn't apologised for assaulting him, and he states that he's planning his revenge. He says that he can't continue to be treated with prejudice. Oh yes, the prejudice where you give in a hundred thousand pounds and a thousand pounds a month and get to live rent free and eat whatever you like and assault people in a house. Wow, you have a hard life, kid. But anyway, he says he can't cope with being treated with prejudice and also claims during that that it's all down to money, that he's this victim, that he's basically somebody who's being treated terribly. I know, you're all sitting thinking, poor Schreiber, he's had such a tough time. Anyway, it's also worth noting at this point that Schreiber was also really researching the whole area of revenge on the internet. This is in the weeks leading up to the events that take place in April 2021. 1st of March, 
he searches for revenge on gold digging mum. So again, think about what that says. Richard and his mother are happy together. He can't handle that. For him, he's got to find a way of bastardizing their relationship, of making their relationship not loving, not connected, not a thing of beauty, to make it into something bad. His mother's just a gold digger. She's not interested in Sir Richard. She's created this whole situation because she wants money. So we're instantly introduced to the insight he has and the beliefs and myths and illusions about their relationship. Now, on the 26th of March, he looks up consumed by thoughts of revenge. So again, he's looking to either have those feelings confirmed or he's seeking advice on how to manage them. Also researches family counselling. So that would have been good, Schreiber. That would have been the one I would have suggested. Out of the list, go for the family counselling. Try it. Might have worked. Bit of family therapy, mediation, who knows? Could have created a better place. But again, it shows conflict, doesn't it? So on one level, I'm consumed with jealousy. I've got this gold digging bitch of a mother. On the other, I'm really feeling unhappy and I think we could do some family counselling. So there's some kind of balancing act, isn't there? He's not met the tipping point yet. He also looked up never satisfied mental state and wanting mind of unhappiness and depression. Interesting, because both of those again say that there is some insight there. He's thinking, why am I never satisfied? Why do I feel constantly unhappy? Am I choosing that? So at this point, in spite of the fact that I know what plays out and it is unfortunately disastrous, I still feel that there is this level of insight within him that recognises that as much as he's got all of this burning anger, resentment, hostility, there is a part of him that can see that it might be he that's the problem. And I wish that he'd just taken one of those routes, like the family counselling, the reading about why he's never satisfied, the starting to own that. Because like I said, you can't change what you don't acknowledge. And it feels like at that point, he still hadn't come to the conclusion that we're going to end up talking about, unfortunately, very shortly. Now, in March 2021, he actually writes to his best friend, James Reed, and this is what he says. Simply put... I contemplate murdering them all morning, day and night. It's not what I want to think about, but it's the truth. I want them to suffer. I think and strategize every single day about how it's best to murder my mother and co. That's how bad my mind is. I mean, I'd have rang the police if I'd been his mate. Just saying, I'm sure that he didn't take it seriously, but I just rang the police. I know I say it on all my videos, if you get something like that, just call the police, speak to the emergency services because there is something really bad going on. And the fact is that even at that point, he's acknowledging this isn't right. There is something wrong about this. So there is again that place where we are not at the tipping point. It's not got to the place of disaster that it's gonna actually arrive at. There were options, there were insights, there were possibilities. There was a chain of causation that could have been broken. He also tells another friend, the short story is my mum is a gold digging fucking bitch. She is a selfish, manipulative, toxic gold digging bitch. We moved here 17 years ago, this huge house with a partner. She's only there to cook for him and take his money. He's a multi, multi-millionaire. He's never had to work a day in his life. He's inherited everything, all property, all land, basically around the world. He's an absolute C-U-N-T. He's horribly racist, horribly backwards, horribly old-fashioned, horribly English. I don't have a good word to say about him. Frankly, I can't stand him. You can literally see the vitriol pouring out of him, can't you? I mean, basically, to some degree, he's described himself because he's got all those things, not the partner necessarily, but he's got all those things. He's been handed it all on a plate. How much of this is a reflection of his own self-loathing? He says that Sir Richard hasn't had to work a day in his life. It won't be true either because even though Sir Richard has all of this great wealth, when you have a massive estate, it takes a hell of a lot of work and there's a lot of things that you need to do and there's a lot of things you need to control. It's a business. 
And obviously, if you're a landowner with all that money, it's a business you run well. It's not just handed to you on a plate. But how much of this is Schreiber's self-loathing? This projection, which is actually a description of who he is. And I think that self-loathing is ever present for Schreiber. I think that Sir Richard is probably everything that he wishes he could have been and everything he'll fail to be. Also, he WhatsApps his girlfriend, Sathia, and he actually says these words. If I did something bad to Mum and Richard, what would you do? And she replies, I'd tell the police, Sathia, you are a well-adjusted human being. I say that because we all know on so many crime things, when somebody says something like that, often they don't get that kind of response. And she's just like straight to the jugular. I would tell the police because it would be a terrible thing. Don't do it. Simple as that. So he's expressing these thoughts and feelings and he's also testing out the people around him. And she gives a very appropriate response to that situation. So 6th of April, 2021. This is the day before the anniversary of his dad's death. So obviously it's a very challenging emotional time. And Schreiber actually looks up online these particular titles. The Hidden Upsides of Revenge, that's BBC Futures. How to Overcome Deep-Seated Desires for Revenge, 13 Steps. The Psychology of Revenge. Ever want to get revenge? Try this instead with the New York Times. Why betrayal hurts so much and who seeks revenge from psychology today? I read psychology today a lot. I kind of enjoy it. It's got some very good articles in it. But he's kind of looking up that persistent issue around revenge. And then he sends a text message to his sister, Rose McCarthy, and he says, raising a glass to dad who passed away eight years ago today, RIP. You remember, right? Your real father, David. Not the one who bought you, who you call father, hashtag covered love. So, clearly can see deep resentment in that message and also a real resentment to the fact that she has a great relationship with Sir Richard, who actually has brought her up as well and protected her and financially looked after her and is still present in her life and didn't choose addiction to some degree over her. You can see why Rose has this relationship. Anyway, Rose does respond to Schreiber, tells him he's out of line, but also says, by the way, the anniversary isn't until the following day. So he'd actually got that wrong. And I guess that that would have really made it smart for him as well, because he's trying to be like really aggressive and let her know that she's not really thinking about her real dad, but she actually does know the day that he died. So essentially it kind of would annoy him. Now, the 7th of April, 2021, this is according to Schreiber, by the way, he goes and he lays daffodils on his father's grave at St. Mary's Church in Stalbridge. Then he goes back and starts painting on this abstract painting that he's been working on. Apparently during this period of time, and it wouldn't be unusual for somebody who's struggling or having a bad day and has some issues with alcohol. He claims that he took a couple of glasses of gin and tonic and also a glass of wine. He said that he was quite tipsy, but he wasn't drunk. He also says that around this time, he had a conversation with Sir Richard about his dad. Now, Sir Richard at this point, by the way, is 83 years of age. So to just put that in context for you, he's 83. This is not a man who is very able to defend himself. And um, this is a man who we know has got some growing resentments towards Schreiber, but isn't somebody who goes out of his way to be a horrendous human being. We've seen from his generous nature and his open heartedness to the family that he very much is a protector and caretaker. Anyway, apparently Schreiber has this conversation with him about his father. Then Anne returns. She's also gone and visited her ex-husband's grave. And Schreiber later stated, apparently, Richard and I were sat peacefully in the office. Mum came in. She took one look at me and said, you are drunk just like your father. So apparently after Anne said these words, Schreiber basically follows it into the kitchen and shouts, I am not drunk, which no one ever says unless they're drunk. Let's all be honest with that. I mean, if you say to somebody, you're drunk, and the person's not drunk, they're like, I'm not drunk. Why do you think I'm drunk? 
you don't follow somebody into a kitchen shouting at the top of your voice, I'm not drunk, whilst you like walk with your glass tipping over you. But basically that's what happens. And then he punches her in the back. So this violence ensues. And it's at this point that a really murderous turn basically occurs. Schreiber says, this is what happened. There was a knife on the island and I just went completely crazy. And I saw the knife and the voice in my head just said, attack, attack. I picked up the knife and I started stabbing my mum. Richard came in and I think he tried to stop me and I started stabbing him and I just couldn't stop attacking my mum and Richard. So that's his explanation. That's what Schreiber says. He just snaps and all of a sudden he's stabbing people. Now, Anne, bear in mind characters, who are we going to believe? Is it Anne the mother? Is it Schreiber, the violent alcoholic? Who are we going to believe? But Anne basically gives a completely different account. So she says that she was cooking in the kitchen. She's in a good mood. And she suddenly heard what she described as a kerfuffle. She believed at that point that her son had actually started attacking Sir Richard whilst he was in his study. It's actually thought that the way the attack began was that Schreiber actually glassed Sir Richard in his face with a whiskey tumbler, which would have been horrifically injuring. I mean, just think about the weight of a whiskey tumbler and then actually glassing somebody in the face with it. Then she turns around and she actually sees her son enter the kitchen and basically she said he had this incredibly frightening determined look in his eyes he then grabs a 20 centimeter kitchen knife from the knife block on the kitchen island at this point she obviously is very anxious and nervous but also she's thinking yes this is out of character but surely i'll be able to handle this so she actually says don't be silly and she walks towards him and that is such a natural reaction when we have children even if our children are acting in a way that isn't in accordance with what we consider normal, we kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. And we think that whatever happens, they would never harm us, right? Because they're our kids. So Anne's frame of reference is that she's not in a potential harm situation, how wrong she is. Because then he just proceeds to stab her. Now, Richard obviously has heard this happening. He comes in shouting at Schreiber, trying to protect his wife. Now, Anne didn't see what happened at this moment in time because this is all complete chaos, but she later stated he was definitely not himself. I would swear on oath that the man who came in my kitchen could have been a total stranger. He looked not out of normal, but unusual because I was shocked when I saw him. His eyes were very unusual. His face was screwed up in an extraordinary grimace. He looked very, very out of control. I believe that he stabbed me. I received some stab wounds from him and I remember looking at the knife in me and being surprised that it didn't hurt. Which a lot of people, by the way, say that when they're stabbed, because of the adrenaline and cortisol and the shock, they genuinely don't feel the actual impact pain. What they feel is like being punched. So what she's describing there is very, very common. But again, she's given us this insight into the fact that when she's looking at her son in this chaos and confusion, she can't compute that it is her son. He looks so different. But obviously at this moment in time, she's been dangerously, dangerously injured. Now, like I said, we can't therefore absolutely know what the catalyst for the violence was. We have Schreiber's analysis of it, apparently happily sat having a chat, then his mum causes the issue, and we have her remembering the situation, which is completely different, where it seems that Schreiber has just gone out of his way to attack Sir Richard for no reason by glassing him. And I think, with respect, we're going to come down on the side of Anne, because she was in her right mind and she has little to gain from making this up. Now, whatever catalyst for violence was, Schreiber launched an utterly frenzied knife attack on the couple. And his mother was pleading with him to stop. Now, he later recalled that he literally couldn't. He absolutely couldn't stop. In fact, not only couldn't he stop, he was able to recall that instead of stopping, he went back and forth between the pair stabbing them. Now, at some point, Sir Richard actually managed to limp upstairs onto the landing. He tries to set off an alarm. He tries to ring the police on the way. 
at this point, Schreiber knows that he needs to pursue him to stop that happening. He actually finds a second knife and then he stabs him a further five times. Now, Schreiber claims that he has absolutely no memory of this happening on reflection, but this is definitely what played out. And Schreiber says, when asked about this, my mind was completely frazzled. I wanted to leave behind the horror show I had caused, say my goodbyes and end my life. So he's able to reflect that even though he's completely out of his mind and doesn't remember carrying out some of these stabbings, that he feels like this is gonna be his swan song, essentially. There's only gonna be one way out. He's gonna to have to kill himself. Now Anne, his mother, she was stabbed more than 10 times in the neck and the back with a kitchen knife. She suffered 15 separate injuries. That's including wounds to her head and her body. And to put it into context with you guys, she was so badly injured that when medics attended, they actually thought that she looked like she'd been in a serious car crash. It took 27 liters of blood to save her life, 27 liters. Your body has five liters of blood in it, 27 liters just to save her. And also in spite of the fact that she survived, Schreiber had actually managed to partially sever her spinal cord, and that means that she's been left paralysed. She also was spent a year in hospital following that attack, a year. That's how serious it was. So Richard, well, he was stabbed five times, and one of those knife wounds went 12 centimetres into his heart. 12 centimetres, that gives you an idea of just how deep that attack was. Now, after the attack occurs, Schreiber actually changes his clothes, gets into Sir Richard's Range Rover and leaves. He heads for East London. I just want you to think about that for a minute as well, because remember, we're meant to at this point believe that Schreiber is completely out of his mind. He's completely unable to compute what he's just played out. He's unaware of what he's really done and so on and so forth. And yet he changes his clothes. Well, is that what you'd do if you were highly irrational? No. If you're highly irrational and if you're fleeing, why would you take the time to change? And why wouldn't you call an ambulance for your mortally injured mother? The only person that Schreiber is thinking about in that moment is Schreiber. Simple as. And the absolute insult of the fact that he uses Sir Richard's Range Rover to escape. Now, after he leaves that scene, Schreiber then sends like lots of voice messages to his friends and family. And I have to say at this point, he does believe that he has murdered both his mother and Sir Richard. So I guess arguably we could say, well, that's why he didn't call an ambulance because as far as he was concerned, it was too late. In a voice message to his friend, Josh Adamson, he actually says he's sorry that he'd made a mistake, that he'd let emotions get the better of him. And he actually tells him in his last message that he won't ever hear from him again because he's killed his mother and her partner. He claimed that lies, deceit and denial had become too much. Really, Schreiber? You think that a bit of lying, deceit and denial is a reason to attack your mother and stepfather who have literally provided for your entire life with a massive knife and kill them. Yeah, that seems rational. Again, I appreciate, I definitely think there is some mental decline here, but I don't think we're dealing with insanity at all. This is somebody who has gone out of their way to build this resentment and not to work through it and also is an individual who's had a lot of opportunities to think about different options and has been searching for different options and has chosen not to take them. So I'm going to leave the empathy and sympathy at the door on that level. Also, he then leaves a voice message for his half-brother, Adam Schreiber, and he tells him his life's over, as was his mother's and Richard's. So he's kind of informing people of what he's done, but he's also like including himself in this triad because he's now thinking that there's no point him living. And I think probably at that point he was genuinely very suicidal. In another voice message to his friend James Reed, again, he confesses to killing his mother and Sir Richard. And he also says that he's lying in blood and was gonna kill himself. 
He also says he didn't appreciate being beaten up by Richard and also refers to his gold digging mother. Now I have an issue with this because if you have remorse and self-reflection and a recognition of the heinous actions that you've just carried out, the last thing you're gonna do is blame the person that you've killed because you're gonna be so encompassed and aware of how sinister your actions have been that you're likely to be feeling very bad for them. But the fact is he's making excuses. So he's saying, well, Sir Richard beat me up and my mum's a gold digger. So therefore, at the end of the day, yeah, I've heinously stabbed them to death. But when it comes down to it, they kind of deserved it. Finally, he leaves a voice message for his sister. Now, at this point, he does actually apologise to her for what he's done. He also says that she's a fantastic sister. But in the same sentence, he calls her a liar and a gold digger like his mother. He's not good at this apologising, is he? Just a bit of advice to you all out there. You know when you apologise, when it comes with a but, it's not an apology, is it? It's a, I'm really sorry, but it's still your fault and this is why. And that's kind of what he's doing. But again, he plays out this systemic blame of the wider family, he says that he can't take the lies and the hatred anymore, even though the only person in the family who's been negative and hateful is actually him. But never mind. When should the truth ever stop people from just believing their own bias? Now, just after 7 p.m., Schreiber's girlfriend, Sathya, she receives a bizarre notification off the bank for a £30,000 deposit that's been put into the bank by Schreiber. And she also gets a note that says, love from Thomas. At this point, she's worried, understandably. She's probably thinking something seriously wrong has occurred for him to have done that and she tries to call him, she tries to message him and can't get through. Schreiber then does call her back and he is sobbing. And she actually later stated that this is how it played out. He was like crying and said he'd fucked up and he killed Richard and his mum. And he continued saying he wanted to take his life and was covered in blood. So again, he's desperate to let people know what's happened, but I think he's looking for sympathy in his moments. And Schreiber begs to see her, but she leaves her flat straight away and calls the police. Like I said, this girl is great. This girl is what every well-adjusted human should be like. Firstly, she thinks, I'm not having somebody who's just murdered two people come to my home. What have they got to lose? And secondly, I'm gonna do exactly what I told you. If you did anything to your step-parent and mother, I was gonna inform the police. So she's brilliant, tells the police that this is happening and obviously informs them that there is a concern. Now on the 7th of April, 9 p.m., this is following a concerned call from a member of the public, armed police end up going to Sir Richard's home at Moor Hill. Now they get in by smashing a glass of conservatory door, they enter the kitchen area and all they can see is just like blood everywhere. It's all over the kitchen. Also the kitchen cabinets are covered in blood and of course there they find a really badly injured Anne. She's barely breathing at this point. She's got a large laceration to her chest area. She's got quite a lot of small lacerations to her upper left side and they end up having to airlift her to Southmead Hospital in Bristol. She's in critical condition but wow, I mean wow, against all the odds we're talking about, this woman is pure resilience. She survives the attack, but as I said earlier, she gets these life-changing injuries. Police then follow the blood trail, essentially, as they clear each of the rooms, and that's when they find the body of Sir Richard is in a massive pool of blood outside his bedroom door. He's got horrific facial injuries, as well as the obvious fatal stab wounds that I talked about earlier on. He actually has a broken walking stick lying nearby. He's got defence cuts to his hands where he's tried to protect himself. There is blood splashed all across the wall in front of him. And he is actually pronounced dead at 9.15pm. So an awful scene for the police to walk into. And also how unexpected, you know, we've got this life of luxury, this place of potential and possibility, and it's ended up in this family massacre. That would not be something the police are used to at all. Now, when forensics went in, the experts actually find Schreiber and Sir Richard's footprints in the blood. Footprints are also found in the pantry, the study, on the stairs and upstairs. So later that night, police are out, 
most important thing is to apprehend Schreiber and they spot the Range Rover that have been linked to the attacks traveling eastbound on the A303. And this led to a really lengthy police pursuit. In fact, with respect, Schreiber did a bit of an OJ. Bit of an OJ, not lying. Bit of an OJ Simpson. Travels over 90 miles. That's through Wiltshire, Hampshire, and Berkshire and Surrey, in fact. And he was going at speeds of like 135 miles per hour before they actually managed to stop him on Chiswick Highway in Hammersmith, West London. That was at 10.30 p.m. When he was arrested, he was actually found with two passports, a phone charger, and a packed suitcase. So as much as he's saying he wants to kill himself, it seems like he's also trying to make a bit of a quick exit, shall we say. So I may kill myself, I may go to Barbados, I may kill myself, I may take a trip around Europe. You know, I don't think he's definitely made his mind up. That said, I do think he's in a very, very traumatized state. And I do think he's certainly in a precarious mind psychologically. And he's considering the potential of not allowing himself to continue living. Because when the police actually get him, Schreiber manages to stab himself in the chest. So he's stabbing himself whilst they're trying to dramatically apprehend him. He pulls out this knife that is grabbed from the mansion. So he's used the two at the mansion, but he's taking this third knife and he just basically turns it on himself, plunges it into his chest, stabs himself multiple times. And to put that into context, he was so dangerously attacking himself, they actually have to taser him because otherwise he would have killed himself. And the police have to remove his clothes because they don't know where to stem the blood because he's inflicted these wounds. And at this point, Schreiber isn't asking for help. He's asking for quite the contrary. He's just shouting at the police and begging them to shoot him. In fact, the police record says, he said, please kill me now. Please just shoot me. I'm asking you to put a bullet in my fucking head. So he's not in a good place, is he? He's not in a situation where some of our psychopathic serial killers would be. Yes, he doesn't want to be apprehended potentially, but I think this is more about some emotional turmoil and pain there as well, isn't it? He's struggling deeply, he's conflicted, and I would imagine that unlike some of our psychopathic serial killers and psychopathic killers, this is an individual who does have a level of conscience and is seriously dealing with some mental health decline. Although, as I said, I don't think he's insane. Now, at hospital, he told staff, I was drunk and just snapped and attacked my mum with a knife. I attacked my mum and Richard with a knife and then tried to kill myself, which I think is probably a pretty accurate reflection of what's gone on. Schreiber also calls his sister Louisa whilst he's on remand at Winchester Prison whilst he's awaiting trial. And he actually says to her, I am so sorry. Absolute, complete madness. I'm waking up every day, hoping to wake up from this nightmare. I had a complete loss of control. It's complete madness. It doesn't make any sense and I am so sorry. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. I didn't want to hurt anyone and I've done the opposite. So again, there is some reflection that I'm not excusing him by that way. What he did is absolutely reprehensible. He was a spoiled and entitled brat who used resentment and bitterness to carry out and excuse these crimes. But do I think he is a monster, as people would say? No, I think this is an individual who genuinely has recognised the gravity of his actions and the impact of those actions. And I don't imagine for one minute that he has that sense of justice running through his veins when he's having those conversations. I think he's probably looking at the abyss and black hole of the rest of his life and realizing how ridiculous, unfair, unnecessary and reprehensible his actions are. But again, a lot of that will be to do with his ego and the fact that he is now stuck on remand and stucking at serving a very lengthy sentence. You know, when it's about you realizing that you've done something to screw up your own life, then wow, things can come into 2020 vision, can't they? Now Schreiber also asks about his mother's condition and his sister says, listen, she's had her spinal cord partially severed. She's paralyzed. She's unable to breathe without a ventilator. And Schreiber literally says, I don't understand why she can't move her legs. And Louisa says, because you stuck a knife in her neck. So he knows what he's done, but even in prison, he isn't concluding the ramifications of the reality of those actions. And I don't feel sorry for him, by the way. But I'm saying there is kind of a separateness between an individual like him 
and an individual who goes out of the way to cool and calculatedly murder people and have literally no remorse over it. There is something different about this case that he is showing signs of a slow and growing realisation of the horror that he's caused. And rightfully so, we hope he feels that nightmare every single day. When it comes to court, that's November 2021, it's a three-week trial and that starts at Winchester Crown Court. Now, Schreiber is charged with Sir Richard's murder and the attempted murder of his mother. He pleads not guilty to both of those counts. He does admit to Richard's manslaughter, but the prosecution are like, mate, you are bang to rights. We are not interested in your plea deal. And again, it's taking a risk, isn't it? Because arguably, if Schreiber can convince people that Sir Richard had maybe been violent and Sir Richard had maybe caused the altercation, then arguably manslaughter might be possible and at least they get that amount of time for him and he'd agree it and then the trial will be sorted in that way. But no, the prosecution are like, we have enough evidence, we believe, that your plea deal means nothing. We want you for murder. So that pursue occurs and they go for the murder conviction. The prosecution actually state Moore Hill had been the setting of a ferocious and sustained attack by the defendant upon his two victims, and the place looked like a war zone. Now, Schreiber did plead one of the special defences to murder. He pleaded diminished responsibility. Now, to put this in context for you, diminished responsibility isn't allowed to be applied anywhere else apart from murder. It is special because it can only be used as a defense to murder. So this is when you bring in diminished responsibility. So Schreiber claimed he was basically acting with diminished responsibility due to abnormality in his mental function that had caused him to lose control. He also brought in in his defense that he didn't intend to kill his mother. In fact, he said, I loved my mother, my sisters and my family. This is not who I am as a human being. I haven't been well. And unfortunately, I was too much of a coward to seek help. Again, we're going to struggle with that, aren't we? We've got the text messages. We've got the letters. He wasn't loving in many ways towards his mother. And he certainly wasn't acting in a way that represents what he's just said that. We can't deny that he obviously has some loving feelings towards his family. Definitely, they will be there. But it seems to have this constant conflict and overview and assimilation of bitterness, hostility and aggression thrown and directed towards his mother because he believes that she was more interested in money than him. So again, it doesn't necessarily add up what he's talking about in this moment in time, certainly as far as the prosecution would be concerned. Now, during the questioning in court, Schreiber is actually asked, you know, did you want to hurt your mother? And he replied, no, of course not. Do not be ridiculous. She's my mother. We've had some tricky times, but I didn't want to hurt her. At times, I hated her and Sir Richard, but I didn't want to hurt them. She's my mother. We're joined at the hip. It sounds crazy. I wanted to give my mum a hug. I wanted to have a nice drink to celebrate. I didn't want to hurt her. I'm a peaceful man. I'm a calm man. I'm not a monster. But there and then, I was a monster and I couldn't stop. But we're all going to struggle a little bit with that statement. And also, you do sound a little bit like Ed Kemper when you're saying that about your mum. Just saying it, he sounded a bit like that too. I loved my mother, even though I cut her head off and then had sex with it. But you know what I'm saying? Probably doesn't make sense to the people listening because you stabbed her to death nearly and you called her a gold digger and you resented her massively, but also you wanted to give her a hug apparently. It doesn't really make sense, but also shows conflict and clearly there is conflict there. And again, I don't doubt that he does have loving feelings for her. Now Schreiber claimed that when his mum branded him, you're drunk just like your father, there was this snap. And he had this voice in his head that just said, attack, attack. And it's at this point he picked up the knife and completely lost it. So that was the motivation. So the 17th of December, 2021, it takes four hours of deliberation. And the jury, genuinely, they couldn't reach a unanimous verdict. So some of them were struggling with giving the verdict per se, and it means that they couldn't come to that conclusion. So the judge then says, okay, well, I'm gonna accept a majority verdict. So after that was given, it took about 30 minutes and the jury returned. And at this point, Schreiber is found guilty of Sir Richard's murder. 
and his mother's attempted murder. And that was by a margin of 11 to one. So as one person on that jury did believe that he was not guilty, i.e. they believe he was suffering from some kind of mental impairment during that episode. So the jury basically dismissed Schreiber's defense that he was suffering this mental disorder and that he wasn't therefore in control of the killing. And they throw that out because they believe that he was fully competent at that moment in time to have not made that decision. So December 2021, Judge Mr. Justice Graham, who had already indicated to Schreiber that he'd be facing a life sentence, he has to then set a minimum term. Now, he looked at mitigating factors and the mitigating factors that he explored were Schreiber's mental health at the time of the attack and also the fact that, with respect, Schreiber had had no previous convictions, so they are mitigating factors. But when he weighed up the aggravating factors, well, these included the fact that it was a stepfather and stepson relationship, so he chose to kill his own stepfather. There's a massive breach of trust there, isn't there? Sir Richard was in his 80s, he was elderly, he was vulnerable. Also, Sir Richard suffered two attacks during the killing, downstairs in the kitchen, then upstairs on the landing, which shows a pursuit. It wasn't one single blow, this was a protracted killing. Also, another aggravating factor, the victim was killed in his own home, a place that should have been a place of sanctuary, serenity, safety. And the judge actually referred to Schreiber's breathtaking sense of entitlement at Moorhill. I do love a judge summing up. And I do think if we were gonna take a sentence from this whole case that definitely sums it up perfectly, we're just gonna say it again. Schreiber's breathtaking sense of entitlement at Moorhill. Absolutely. He could not have been more entitled as a human being. I have rarely come across a case where you look for the reasoning behind why somebody could go from being an individual who's relatively pro-social to an individual of absolute murderous intent and find literally no reason. But this case does it. I look at Schreiber's past, I look at his trauma, I weigh up with his action. It's incalculable that we've arrived at this conclusion. I mean, literally, there are no reasons for the reason that Sir Richard and his mother ended up in this situation. Schreiber was very well looked after. In fact, he had a life that most of us would like, desire, want, dream of, and it wasn't enough. And it wasn't enough. That's the reality. Sir Richard got killed because Schreiber felt he didn't have enough. And I appreciate we're all accepting that he was trying to deal with wounds from the past with his parents' divorce and his father's death. And that's awful, but I'm sorry, that shouldn't land on the shoulders of Sir Richard, who had always extended a welcome to him and his family and tried to also protect his father and so on and so forth. So those aggravating factors are big. And that's why the judge sentenced him to life with a minimum term of 36 years. A guy's in the UK that is a very, very big sentence. And also let's bring into context that for many individuals who are sentenced, who come from, shall we say, aristocratic lines, they often get less time in prison. It's not right, but there seems to be a bias that that occurs. Not in this case. This judge was like, you had everything. You had everything given to you and all you did was screw it up and do absolutely disastrous damage to your wider family, as well as taking a life of an innocent individual. Now, in the victim impact statements, Schreiber's sister, Louisa, said, despite his age, Sir Richard still had a lot of living to do. And actually, he was meant to walk her down the aisle at her wedding this year. That is such a loss for her. You know, to not have that man present who'd given her and provided her with all this beautiful experience in her life. Another victim impact statement, Schreiber's sister Rose stated, you took a knife to our world. In doing so, you took away Richard. You took away the most innocent and kindest of men in the most brutal of ways. He never stood a chance. You also killed our mother. You took her life away and left her trapped in a body she can't use and is in constant pain. Tom, I love you, but I struggle so badly with what you've done. What a waste of all these lives for a moment of anger. That victim impact statement, I mean, wow. 
that just embodies and personifies exactly what's played out, doesn't it? I cannot beat that with my own words. The fact that she's able to fully acknowledge how his actions have exploded and imploded the world as they knew it, how she still has deep love for her brother, but that what he has done has got such ramifications that not only does she no longer have the kindest and sweetest man to protect her in life, her mother has essentially been killed as she knew it. Obviously, Anne is still alive, but she is not living fully. She's had her freedom, her autonomy, her bodily options taken away from her because of her own son. And for the family, the ripple effect has such grave consequences, doesn't it? And it's really difficult because we all know the reality is that money doesn't buy you happiness. But I think that if Schreiber hadn't been in that family, at least they would have continued to have a luxurious sense of living, a community and family that fostered a great deal of positives and a long life lived together and shared. And all of those were stolen for what? For resentment? For wanting more? For feeling entitled? For believing that even though you have it all, you still felt that you deserve more? And it's a lesson to all of us, isn't it? These kind of cases. It's a lesson that when you feel that seed of bitterness and rage and resentment, and a lot of us feel it, a lot of us has those difficult feelings, do something to neutralise it you know, get online like he was, but then follow through. Families are full of chaos and dysfunction. And also, they're not always equal. People get treated differently to their siblings, and it means that they feel less loved, but manage that. It's not your problem. That's the adults who are meant to love you as much problem. But you need to do something within you to shift it. Don't just spend your life projecting all that negativity to a point where you resent the world around you. That's a terrible way to live. That's one of the things that I think I take from this more than anything. Why does life have to be fair? It isn't. It's perpetually unfair. But what we can do is we can work really hard on ourselves so that when we're met with injustice, we have the resilience to cope with it and not to break us. It not to make us into people who are bitter, hostile, resentful, and in cases like this, dangerous. I hope you found this one interesting. I think it's really sad that Sir Richard was killed this way. I hope his family are finding some sort of peace. I think it will be incredibly difficult for them. And I truly, truly believe that there is a deep message of meaning in this, which is that when we practice gratitude, when we feel grateful, even when things aren't balanced and equal, it can do a huge amount to change our psyche and make us feel a lot more embracing and empathic than what Schreiber experienced in this situation. Also, let's all agree that judge gave him the harshest sentence he could have got. So at least we're in a scenario where justice was served. Thanks for joining me. I hope you found it interesting. Let me know, write me a comment, give me a like. Subscribe if you've watched all of this and you found it interesting. I put a lot of work into my deep dive research so that you learn something that you might not have known. If you know about this case and you've got any extra facts, please let me know. Do join me on a Wednesday and a Sunday where I will release content religiously. Also, thanks to Patreon again. And if you like my merch, there is a link below. And don't forget, you can get t-shirts now, you can get hoodies, you can get mugs. There's loads of new slogans coming that you guys designed. Thanks for joining me. See you again soon.